so you can all um, join in and I will be keeping five minutes at the end um, for those questions. Marie, I am delighted to see you. Hello. We will do the introduction. Hi. Hi. We'll do the introductions just in a minute. And Hugh's joined us as well. We have one more and then we've got a full house. Lorena, um, any minute you will be coming, coming in. Um, she had a few technical issues before, but I thought we'd all got them sorted out. So we'll just give her uh, another minute to, to join us. Um, well, what we might do, Marie, is if you if you would, if we start with the virtual introductions, um, and if we start ladies first, if you would like to say hello to, to our audience and just say um, who you are and, and where you're from, that would be absolutely fan fantastic. The usual style, please. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Helen. Uh, my name is Marie Steinteller. I am with a company called TrueLayer, which is an open banking financial infrastructure platform uh, based out of the UK. I'm actually personally based uh, in Hong Kong. So good evening from this side of the world. And um, I look after our global go to market. What that means is that I have used the past 10 or so years. I have uh, experience in technology to look at product, regulatory, and go-to-market considerations to figure out where TrueLayer should expand to next for our clients. And um, currently, a lot of my focus has been on Australia and some other regions in APAC, so um, perhaps I can cover some of those in today's session. We certainly will, and congratulations. You have just brought in a, a big funding, so congratulations to Francesco and the team. Well done, TrueLayer. And Hugh, um, Please, where are you from and what do you do? Hugh Davis, we all know who you are, but go on. Hey, Helen, um, thank you again for the invite to um, uh, to take part. So yeah, I'm Hugh Davis. Um, I'm one of the co-founders at Ozone API. Uh, we're a technology platform that help banks deliver uh, really high performing standards based APIs. So um, I guess we're also an infrastructure provider on the bank side, helping, helping banks um, adapt to this new world of open banking and expose uh, standards-based APIs. Been in this open banking space for for quite a number of years now as well, and um, sort of formally played a role at the UK's open banking implementation entity, where I um I, I was leading the development of the ecosystem. Um, so uh, so yeah, looking forward to this conversation. And we will uh, we're going to kick off and just wait for Lorena if you can if you can hear us. Um, there's there's a virtual seat on the stage uh, waiting for you. So please join whenever you can. Okay. So my first question um, is really um, comes from the fact that you know o open banking was created in the UK. Um, you know we created the the, the template. Um, for it, the blueprint, and, and other regulators around the world were told, look at the UK um, for, for insights and learning. So as a Brit, we can all be very, very proud of that. Um, but I, but now the next sort of stage of the journey is from open banking to open finance, and it should really just have been called open up. But how is that playing out differently around the world? So it's created in the UK. I'm interested to explore with you both in terms of how the whole open banking, open finance, how it's playing differently, and then looking at whether it's market um, driven frameworks or whether we go for the governance led. So it's a market, it's like the old argument, market driven or governance led. So. Um, Marie, would you like to start off uh, the conversation, really, um, and sharing some of your insights from Asia Pack? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, at a high level, I would say that, so totally echo your comment that open banking in the UK uh, really managed to capture the imagination. So regardless of which region I've, I've visited here in, in APAC, and it's been quite broadly spread, um, everyone knows about the UK, and everyone knows what's happened there. Um, that doesn't mean necessarily that every regulator in those uh, APAC markets is is ready to jump on board the train of mandatory centralized oversight, let's define API standards, but uh, but there's definitely interest in what can this do for consumers. So roughly, you know, when I look at the map, you have on the one hand, very regulatory driven uh, models, and on the other hand, very much market driven, let, let the market decide and consumer demand determine when we actually need to step in and provide some more security. And roughly speaking, in, in APAC, it, the, the, the overall approach is much more market oriented. So there's less of a willingness from regulators to interfere very directly or, or force force opening up very directly. That said, one thing that, um, 
that often gets mentioned in, in, in some markets. For example, Japan is the regulator walks silently but carries a big stick. And I think that's uh, something that banks in the region and financial services providers keep in mind because they are aware of what's happening elsewhere and they don't want the regulator to make it mandatory. So they self-regulate or self-open up or create some sort of industry bilateral agreements to, to make it happen. So that's the kind of thing we we see in, in for example, places like Japan, where it's not mandatory. Uh, banks did at least issue statements to say, we plan to do this, or we plan to engage in contracts, or we don't plan to engage in contracts. On the other end of the spectrum, you have Australia, which I think was very much influenced by, by uh, the UK, who really took a step beyond banking and payment services, and then really said, how can we open up the whole economy? So it's a consumer data right, is what they call it. And it starts with banking, but then expands into utilities and telco. So that's really uh, aspirational and ambitious, which is fantastic. Um, in terms of the the uh, the actual implementation, where I think uh, the regulatory markets often uh, have a have a challenge, is in trying to be too prescriptive around standards. But we can I'll leave that part for a, a, another section of the conversation and um, let you get a word in. Well, <laughs> go for it here. Go on. Um, yeah, it, it, it's interesting. You started off um, sort of positioning the kind of the, the the UK as the pioneers and and I, I think that's both right and wrong because I, I think certainly for for this model of a regulated approach with a really strong central implementation I, I think that's right the UK created a, a a blueprint a blueprint and actually a very significant investment um, made by the, the the nine largest banks and creating this implementation entity and developing a set of standards and, and, and building out a trust framework and things that's, that's been um, kind of passported and, and exported around around the world. Um, however, I think there were many examples of, of open banking, sometimes under different names, um, sort of already out there and running in parallel. I mean, the US, is a, there's a big market driven market, primarily around screen scraping, but putting customers more in control of their own finances and, and, and sharing data with players like um, Plaid and Finistee driving it. Um, China, obviously, huge um, market driven by the super apps. And uh, again, for banks to remain relevant, they needed to integrate into that super app environment. To, it, it, it called something slightly different, but fundamentally the, the, the principles are similar. But yeah, I think as we look around the world, there's the, there's a, there's a few sort of axes to look at. There's, yeah, is it a regulatory driven market or a uh, a market driven market? Um, and we've talked about some of the examples with UK being quite an extreme and, and Europe being quite an extreme version of the regulatory driven. Singapore and um, a, a number of the the uh, markets in Asia Pac being much more market driven. But then there's the governance piece as well. Whether it's whether it's regulation or market driven, is there a coordinated approach? Is there a drive around standards and interoperability? And 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 you can have you can have a regulatory driven market with a much looser industry led approach to creating the standards and the, the the common foundations. And you can have a commercial market, a commercially led market with a more coordinated um, approach. Again, have we we've seen in in markets like Singapore? There was, there was a really interesting paper I read. Oh, we have Lorena. Um, oh, Lore thank you for pausing, Hugh. <laughs> Lorena, oh, I admire I'm so you. sorry. I'm so sorry. This is the biggest uh, tech fail. Anyway, sorry. If you no, continue, I'll jump in later. No, no. I am I have, I'm delighted that you uh, persevered. Thank you. Please um, s introduce yourself and say hello to our audience. Um, we Please t tell everybody a little bit about yourself and where you're from, please. Okay, thanks, Helen. And uh, uh, apologies, everyone, for this uh, mega fail. Um, my name is Lorena Wang. I'm the head of smart banking for HSBC in Hong Kong. And uh, clearly not very technical as I failed to operate this uh, simple um, login. Um, so uh, the reason why my team is called uh, Smart Banking is because uh, HKMA, which is the Hong Kong local regulator, launched the Smart Banking Initiative back in 2017, 2018 time. Um, and uh, there, are, there is uh, seven, eight layers in that, including faster payments, digital identity, etc. But the most important one, or at least in my opinion, is uh, open APIs and uh, pushing that um, in the financial services industry in Hong Kong. 
and uh, um, uh, having having uh, worked on open banking um, in HSBC UK for two years, um, it's actually great to be in Hong Kong leading it from the uh, very beginning. So happy to be joining or be late. Um, we are delighted. No, no, apo no apology required. Absolutely <laughs> delighted. I think he was probably just just wrapping up. So let me ask you the, the same question. You know, open banking uh, was was started in the UK. We created the blueprint, but we were looking about sort of how open banking, open finance is playing out around the world and discussing the different starting points, whether we go for a regulatory driven framework or whether it's market led. Please, it'd be great to have your insight on that. Um, well, I think l let me chip in with the Hong Kong part then, because I, I guess uh, Hugh and Helen yourself probably have UK well covered. Um, so in Hong Kong, um, it, it is regulator driven and uh, um, it is uh, really to, um, uh, there is a, an element of uh, internationally, everybody is doing this and Hong Kong as one of the biggest uh, um, global financial centers should not be lagged behind in that. So um, it, it's, uh, it is regula regulatory driven. However, the, um, the, diff, diff, the different uh, kind of regulation and uh, regulatory structure in Hong Kong as compared with the likes of UK um, made it quite different in terms of implementation. So in the UK, you have uh, um, OBIE leading the uh, implementation across all the banks. In Hong Kong, actually, um, in the past two years, it is uh, the Hong Kong Association of Banks, so the um, banks industry body, is the kind of uh, the leader in designing what's in scope, what's out of scope. And uh, last year, we actually launched uh, what we call Common Baseline, which is uh, um, what banks need to be um, evaluating um, TSPs with. The reasons for that is because um, uh, HKMA actually can't regulate any of the non-bank um, third party, you call it TPP in the UK, we call it TSP here in Hong Kong. And uh, for that reason, it is kind of uh, um, uh, governance and regulate, regulatory requirements passed on from the banks, from the HKMA to the banks, to the third parties. So for open API to um, a partnership to work, for example, between HSBC and a third party, it is required that we reach a bilateral agreement with the third party, and we actually still carry all the regulatory um, responsibilities. So that is the main difference between um, the UK model and the Hong Kong model. Um, it's a bit difficult to say whether this is then, in this case, regulatory driven or market driven, because the regulator did push for it initially, but it's then down to the market, to the industry to implement it. Finds its natural level, absolutely. Yeah. Which is a, a lovely segue into the, the next question, really. So if we sort of do a, a, a sort of whistle-stop tour of the world and, and look at the biggest pros and cons of the pr different approaches around the world, and I suppose the question, therefore, is if, if you were a new market, it's the chicken and the egg, which would you, um, would you lead with regulations or would you, you lead with market forces? I think we've discovered they can find its natural level. But I am curious, uh, Hugh, uh, chicken or egg, market forces or regulatory driven, please? I, I Honestly, I don't, I don't think there's one answer. I think it depends on so many different um, criteria within a market. But, but if I look at the way some of the newer markets around the world are approaching it now, I, I, I think there are some really good examples of where markets are looking at what's happened taking some of the learnings and looking to, to leapfrog. So w one of the next huge markets to, to go with uh, an open banking regulation will be Brazil. Um, it's a massive market, um, some real challenges actually around things like financial inclusion with 40 million. Oh, oh dear, well, Hugh, we've lost your sound. Hugh, are you back with us? We, we, you went a bit darlicky. You've lost your sound. No? Um, I, I wonder if Victor, our track host, could uh, look after you and get him his sound back. He was in full flow there as well. Um, Marie, if you, if you can hear us, it's, a, it's going to be one of those afternoons, isn't it? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, late, late, you're working for your glass of wine out in Hong Kong, I can promise you. You really are. Marie, would you like to, to pick up really that whistle-stop tour around the world, um, the biggest sort of pros and cons of the approaches 
And whether we start with regulatory or, or market led frameworks, please. All right, sure. So uh, taking a slight step back before jumping into specific countries, what what we've seen in our experience is that if you take a market that is um, driven by a regulator to to open up, um, perhaps more aggressively than a than a com than commercial agreements between market participants would initially allow, uh, it often leads to a and I'll say this with a caveat, but to, to more of a level playing field for innovators who are coming up with new and random use cases that you couldn't preempt or, or sort of anticipate before pl placing the framework in, in place. Um, whereas when you look at market driven environments, it generally uh, or generally when 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 they transition from a market driven environment to something that's a bit more regulated, there's a huge focus on use cases, as there should be um, the challenges with uh, with being too use case focused is that sometimes it, it's kind of like when you're planning a software project and you're trying to anticipate upfront all the things that could go wrong, um, which is one reason why you know waterfall projects often take longer than, than you think because you can't always anticipate everything until you get into the weeds and get stuck in and try to build things. And um, that's where I think uh, the, the regulatory approaches that are not designed around um, Kind of consumer outcomes or principles, but rather around specific use cases, have the downside of, of being too prescriptive and restrictive. And likewise, in purely market-driven environments, sometimes the, the players who are uh, most innovative won't even be thinking about using this data because they're in completely different fields. And I think that's something we've seen in the UK and other places where a regulator says, you know what, we should have open banking. Suddenly people who have nothing to do with financial data start thinking of how they could use that data in a really creative way. So whistles, back to the whistle stop tour. Um, and, and I'll leave some of the, the Asian markets for Lorena as well. Um, so Australia, I've kind of spoken about already very much regulatory driven. I think the factors I look at is, you know, how mandatory is it? How broad is it? How centralized is it? How prescriptive is it? Um, I would say that uh, Australia is very mandatory quite broad, very centralized, very prescriptive. And that has a certain impact down, down the line. I think it leads to often slower implementation, fewer small companies coming out in the beginning. Um, then I think I'll talk a bit about Japan where it's not mandatory, it's not super broad, uh, not very centralized, but also not very prescriptive. So, so that's one where what we're seeing happening there is there are a few participants who are creating commercial agreements in this govern and governed framework, but there are no real standards, which makes makes it difficult for for lots of players to come in very easily. Um, and then maybe let's talk a little bit about India, which is very uh, very much it's not mandatory, but it's quite broad, quite centralized, and and reasonably prescriptive. So they have API standards. They have this whole it's called NBFC AA account aggregation framework, which is actually quite an interesting. Um, interesting approach where the whole aim is to the very principles based is we want to drive financial inclusion and make lending easier and more accessible and that's where it's starting and it has this concept of reciprocity built in which is this idea that unlike in the UK where it's pretty one-sided at times it's the banks giving data um, it, it has this idea that if you share data sorry if you get access to data you also have to put data back in which opens up a whole other kettle of worm but it seems to be being picked up in Australia India um, I think places like Brazil are looking at it as well, although not the not the expert there. Um, so those are some examples of markets. And Lorraine, do you want to um, sort of add in there sort of your your view of, of um, the chicken or the egg, you know, the whistle stop tour? Yeah, um, actually, Marie said one word, which is my latest favorite word, but it's a word I can't really pronounce very well. Um, reciprocity. I'm getting better. Um, so this is... Uh, uh, I think uh, Hugh uh, answered your question that there is no perfect answer to that. And I was nodding away to that because um, um, banks really need a reason um, to open up their data to in some frameworks. It basically means we're opening up our data and then we are liable for the usage of that data. So it's kind of you ask yourself why. In that case, unless regulator really mandate it and say this is regulatory requirement, otherwise you basically don't see any reason of doing it. So that's a kind of one side of extreme. The other side of extreme maybe is China, I guess. It doesn't have the open banking framework, um, but it's a reality. It's uh, Although it's kind of focused in a few uh, or a couple even of big players, 
but uh, sharing um, sharing your financial details with a third party and uh, paying um, using the money you have in the bank, but via a third party platform, that is a daily recurrence or, or hourly uh, occurrence. So it's kind of that that is very market driven, but in that, of course, you have those risks and then banks are kind of being pushed to the backstage. Um, and uh, in uh, I, I think Singapore is another interesting one to look at. It's um, similar to what Marie was saying earlier. It's um, uh, you need to pay to play. You need to if you want to take data out, you need to put data in. Um, and uh, the other thing I, I really like about the Singapore model is it, it's focused or primary uh, or, or initially at least um, it's focused on one single use case to them. It's a uh, um, personal financial management. Um, so with, with that, you kind of uh, um, focuses minds and focuses use cases and you have the end customer um, in your mind when you're carrying out these things. But it also eliminates the sharing data for sharing data's sake. Because when it comes to this use case, you ask the question, okay, for example, why do you need six months of transactional data? You just need the end of month balance for three months to, to know um, the kind of cash flow. Um, so that's, I think, another interesting model. Thank you. So, um, Hugh, um, now you're back with us. Thank you. Let's look at the next question, which is, uh, is a lovely sort of follow on. And um, let's look at the important elements that, uh, that we need to standardize um, uh, across all the regions. Um, and I, I know it's going to be about interoperability now. So um, as we started uh, Open Banking in the UK, I think it's right that you lead the conversation. And then um, if, if Maria and, and Lorena sort of chip in as well. Yeah, sorry, I, I missed the question in your ah, second Okay, so can we talk about um, uh, the important elements that we need to standardize? Ah, right, yeah. Interoperability is a, is a sort of the line. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I think there are some really good principles that came out in the conversation now. And apologies, I got cut off. I think my AirPods died. And anyway, uh, hopefully you can hear me okay now. Um, yeah, I think as we look at different markets around the world, there are some, as, as markets look to learn from others, I think there are some core foundations that need to be there, whether it's a regulatory driven or a market driven ap approach. Um, and I think one is, um, and this has been mentioned a couple of times already, actually in the market thinking about what are the outcomes that we want to achieve from this? Um, so again, particularly where there's a regulatory drive, what are the outcomes? What does good look like in the end? Because that helps then frame a lot of the other conversations and considerations. But um, standards are going to be key here. So this is, I mean, fundamentally, many industries have been exposing um, access to other organizations for many, many years. You just look at uh, Google Maps. It's, it's a core capability that now forms the foundation of many other businesses and applications. By the way, this is the most amazing opportunity for banks to leverage their capabilities and assets as a foundation stone for, for others to build on. But for that to work, it has to be done around standards. If, if banks all try and do their own proprietary thing, it isn't gonna work. Um, the big third parties, the small third parties, all want to um, connect to some common standards, some common methods of establishing secure connections, some common methods of um, agreeing consent between the, the user and the, 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 the different parties. So standards are really key. And we're at a point at the minute where um, there are lots of standards emerging. Um, and each market is making a choice around, we'll use this one as a basis and we'll create our own slightly different flavor. I think over time, we'll drive towards much more interoperability, but it may get worse before it gets a little bit better. And I think some of the commercial principles then are really important for, for market success. So we, we've touched on reciprocity and I was going to mention Brazil. I think they're doing a great job actually of reciprocity is one of the foundation pillars of how they're approaching the market. Any player that wants to connect to the big banks has to also expose their own APIs. It, it creates a, a much more balanced market, but also the ability for this to be commercial. Um, I think one of the downsides we've seen in markets like the UK is when it's when it's a big stick and a huge investment, there's, there's less um, incentive to do it well and do it right. And I, I, you just need to look at the API performance of many of the banks. It isn't good enough yet. Um, 
it's too slow. It's and it's a good start point. The good thing about this regulatory catalyst, you create a whole of market effect. It allows a a market to form, but you need some commercial incentives that align to those end user outcomes for the whole thing to thrive. And we'll see that start to happen. But those decisions at the beginning of a market help determine, I guess, how healthy the the ecosystem will be in the short term. Long term, I think it'll all look pretty similar across every market. But there's this: what's the right path to get there? Um, Marie, um, thank you, Hugh. Marie, I'm interested from TrueLayer's perspective because you're on a, a huge global expansion uh, mission at the moment. I can't keep up with the amount of countries that you're launching into. Um, what, what's your perspective then on, on the important elements that we should standardise? Because you'll have a global view and, and, yeah. and need to execute quite quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's a, a great thing to, to think about. Um, you know, because we see so many different approaches in different markets and we see the parts that create issues um, or that are most difficult for us as a as an aggregator of, of these APIs. Uh, and a lot of it, I think, comes down to, you know, what are your common identification, authentication patterns? Um, you know, do you uh, standardize how consumers um can identify who's actually getting access to the data. So this is where I think, you know, having some some clever ways of standardizing how certificates work, for instance. I mean, even now between, you know, the UK and, and Europe, uh, with Brexit coming along, uh, you know, EIDAS certificates, all the detail around that is pretty complicated and we, we manage that for clients, but um, that is something that would definitely benefit from, uh, everyone would benefit from, from more standardization there and more clarity because it helps helps participants, it also helps regulators and it helps some banks as well so that they can actually have better oversight over who is accessing what, where, how. Um, so that, that's an area on, on the exact, uh, I think uh, Hugh, Hugh had mentioned in the, in the small prep chat beforehand, had already talked about things like, you know, FAPI, OpenID, Foundation, things like that, which I'll, I'll leave for, for you to elaborate on if it makes sense, but that's an area that I think a lot of focus will go on onto in the next few years. Um, and then I think some of it is around the specifics of which data and which content should be shared. Um, I'm, I'm less convinced that that's the m most low hanging fruit right now, because I think there is a lot of room for interpretation, even in uh, the UK or in Australia with the initial big four banks who have launched their APIs. Um, the, the more prescriptive you try to be before launching APIs on how exactly those those specific minute fields should look, the, the longer it will take. And I don't think that's the, the right way to, to, to do it. Um, so I wouldn't standardize those things, but identification certif certificates, um, data sharing patterns, encryption methods, things like that would be really helpful. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm interested from HSBC's point of view, you were part of the CMA9, so right at the very forefront of open banking, um, in the UK and therefore in the world. What do you see as, as the most important elements? Um, do you have anything else to, to add? Well, in an ideal world, of course, we would uh, hope that uh, we can redeploy everything that we have developed for the UK. Um, but uh, in, in truth is, I think uh, Marie and Hugh were both alluding to the, the standards uh, at the moment are very varied. And every country have their own views on certain things. And we've, um, my colleagues um, who, who operate globally actually were talking to me about certain countries when they are basically taking the UK and Europe standards um, that's very quick to implement and uh, um, much more cost effective. While as some markets have more prescriptive views on the API standards um, and that would take much longer. We are actually, uh, we in Hong Kong are actually in a quite um, interesting phase as uh, we've now completed phase one and two, um, which is the equivalent of UK phase one, a read-only data, and moving on to the UK equivalent of, um, uh, you know, transactional and account information, as well as payment initiation data. Um, we were supposed to um, finish this within this year, but uh, COVID and 2020 is just not um, uh, your usual year. So we are actually um, right now in the process of working through with the industry as well as uh, with HKMA on what are the things we should consider, how prescriptive we need to be, what are the standards we that, that we need to adopt. We look at UK a lot with the OBIE and looking at the operational standards they've published, customer experience standards, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, interesting times. I don't, I don't really have an answer to your question, Helen. I have my ideal view, but um, um, as, it, as it happens, um, different countries always have different ways of doing things. And as a, a bank that operates internationally, we have to be compliant with every single um, jurisdiction. Challenge, a challenge. Um, Hugh, do you just want to wrap up a little with the standards, please? Yeah, and and so I, I think this is an interesting space, right? Because we're still relatively early in this whole open banking, open finance development. Um, so I think we can and we should expect standards to continue to evolve um, pretty rapidly. So at the minute, we've got we've got a number of different standards that have, have emerged around the world and there are different bits to it. There's a, there's, as Marie was saying, there's some security protocols, how you connect, how you establish trust. Um, then you've got all of the functional layer, how different product types data is exposed and things like that. I think there are areas where um, as, as markets uh, come on board or as open banking moves to open finance, these are going to continue to evolve. Um, so bringing in pensions, bringing in investments, it's, it's going to continue to help shape the standards. And that's a really good thing. So we should expect, I think, lots of change for a prolonged period of time. The bit that's a bad thing is where they, they're divergent and you move away from interoperability. But in the UK, for example, we're on the eighth version of the standards and they've evolved for really good reasons. But right now, all of the banks are on different different versions. Um, so I, I think they will continue to evolve, and that's a really good thing. But we should evolve them with interoperability in mind around those core foundational layers. But one of the challenges for banks and for um, uh, the third party world is just to, to cope with that ever ever evolving set of standards. It will settle at some point. They'll continue to evolve, just like the standards for the World Wide Web or, or, or digital identity, but the pace will slow down. But in the short term, and, and this is one of the things that, that, that we do, we help manage that complexity of, of standards so that banks can expose multiple standards without all of the hassle. It's going to be chaotic for a little while, but, but for good reasons, I think. Um, uh, yeah, well, sorry, just a quick one add on to that. I think that so far we have been talking about uh, open banking, open finance. It's still within the financial services sector. But as the biggest data contributor in this open finance setting, banks actually also would like data from outside of this industry, government data, um, utility company, everything else in your life. And when you add that complexity on top, that the, the standards and interoperability nationally domestically internationally um i think it will take a long while to settle and, and maybe some sort of global standards body or at least standards framework so we've talked about standards we've talked about frameworks and governance but the most important uh, stakeholder in in all of this model is is the customer is is the use case so i would like to now focus on how that we make sure that the customer's outcomes are at the top of the agenda and Lorena, I would love to hear more about the smart banks customers, please, and how you put them first, because I know you do. Thank you. Yes, we do. Um, I, I think the um, that, that's actually um, a, a topic very close to my heart. It's not open banking for open banking's sake. Um, open API is, is just means to an end. It's a way to transfer data securely. But really, the question is, uh, how do you how do you utilize that data to provide better services for the customers? Because at the end of the day, if the customer doesn't see the value of it, um, then they don't give you consent and they will never use open banking services. And then the whole ecosystem dies, essentially. Um, so from our perspective, um, I think the, um, helping you to look at your, your finance from three, 360 degrees would be our first step to start. A few years ago, we did Connected Money in the UK, which is the first uh, high street bank app to bring bring together all the finances and help you to see how you're doing, um, we'll call it balance after bills, and uh, give you quite prescriptive advice of how should you optimize that money. So I think from the, um, the, the kind of uh, consumer, retail consumer and, and wealth management perspective, that's probably still where our heads will be at. And uh, having more data means we can serve you better. But uh, the other um, angle of consumers, I think, uh, is uh, um, instead of the customers we have today, um, the open API, open banking customers could be different. They could be twofold. One is um, 
people who are not your customer at all. They don't have your bank accounts and they don't need to be. If you can provide the services I was talking about without them opening a bank account with you, that's fine too. The, the second um, type of uh, consumer or customer in, in the open banking context, I would say, are the third parties, the developers, the people who are consuming APIs. And maybe UK started with this, this um, um, uh, the, the president that uh, um, APIs tend to be free. You don't charge for it. And that explains who was uh, talking about earlier, the, the qualities and uh, speed, the incentive is not quite there. What if um, it is a product at that, at that banks can actually price for? And then it becomes uh, suddenly a lot more interesting in that regard. So three, three, threefold. One is for our existing customers, open banking is going to give them better customer experience as we have more data of them and service the, their financial needs better. Um, the second part is uh, the, the, the um, second part 2.1 is uh, customers who are not ours today, but will come to us because we provide the most comprehensive services um, that they will need to open an account for. And uh, the other element is the um, TSPs and uh, developers as our customers. Thank you. Marie, thank you very much. Um, Marie, um, TrueLayer, global customers, um, how do you put them first? And how do you make sure they stay at the top of the agenda, please? Yeah, so we, um, we're a B2B business. So our clients, uh, it's really their customers who, who we always have to keep in mind. Um, because ultimately that's what's going to make our clients use our platform more as if it works for their end, end consumers. Um, so I can talk a bit about what we specifically do. A lot of that comes down to the usual best practice in, in terms of customer driven development. So you know, your usual user research, quantitative and qualitative analysis of how, how it's working, not just for our clients, but the end user. Um, and then fundamentally, I think you, you know some of it is Pushing the conversation on from the very theoretical, I think, you know, conversations we had maybe a year or two ago with clients and depending on how mature the market is we're talking about, we still have these conversations today, focus a lot on, okay, well, how many, how many banks are you connected to, how many con banks, uh, sorry, how many countries are you connected in, um, and, and there's this, almost this obsession with that metric of how many banks as if that's what matters. When you look at the distribution, usually what we respond with is, okay, of your customers, how many banks do they bank with? What's the distribution of banks they bank with? What kind of products do they have with them? And what ultimately are you trying to build uh, for them to make their life easier? So we work a lot with clients to refocus the conversation on how is this going to help your end consumer? How is it going to improve conversion? How is it going to, you know, make their life easier? Um, and that that's working really well. And I think that's something we we see in very early maturity um, nascent markets. There is that focus on the technology for the technology's sake, and and then you I think people realize quite quickly once they've gotten past that phase. Oh, now we actually have to make this work for for consumers. So, um, and yeah, I guess the 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 other thing is in in conversations with regulators pushing for principles based approach and saying. You know, what are the, is it competition that you care about? Is it adoption of payments that are more digital? So if you look at Japan, where still you have like 40% of payments are, are, are digital and the rest is all cash. Um, in different markets, we'll have different things they want to push to help consumers. India is all about lending. Um, so that, that's a really helpful lens to always look at our products through. Thank you. Hugh, we've got um, five or six minutes left. So if you could um, answer this question about putting customers at the top of the agenda, and then I'm going to ask everybody to, to wrap up. Yeah, no problem. I, I mean, a, a lot's been said on, on this yeah. already. Um, I, I think a couple of areas that are, are really important. Um, so Marie was mentioning there. So as regulators are approaching this, um, then actually thinking more about outcomes rather than the the technical route to get there is is, is important. Um, and there's some fundamental principles that sit behind this as well that are typically entrenched in data protection regulations around customers own their data, customers have choice. Now, that can be delivered either really well or really badly through APIs, depending on the standards and, and how well implemented they are. So um, 
kind of concentrating on really good user experience for how a customer gives consent and making sure that there's a lot of transparency there whilst making sure it's not too complicated. Yeah. Uh, and this is a tricky balance, right? And I think we'll, we'll, we'll see this evolve over time, but to really give the customers um, a, a feeling of control and trust um, um, whilst ensuring that they are giving consent to the right things and not the wrong things. And again, this is one of the areas I, I think we'll, we'll continue to see it evolve as the use cases evolve, as the sophistication of, of, of the players and the user experiences evolve, but making sure the, the standards and the implementations really focus on great user experience and um, sort of real transparency around the consent piece to help establish that, that confidence and, and control. Thank you. So we've got five minutes left. Um, um, everybody's been a little bit shy. There aren't any questions in, in the chat. So I would like to finish with um, all three of you uh, talking around, um, you know, with the extension, we've talked around a sort of open banking, open finance, and into its um, pensions, insurance, and all the other different products. Does that mean that um, there's not, how long then do you think it is before this becomes business as usual and, and governance and oversight is just part of, uh, sorry, governance and the oversight of, of, of the governance is just part of the, the, the background. I mean, we're very, very governance-led at the moment, but I, I'm wondering if is when it opens out more, whether the governance will just be part of the background, or do we always think that it's going to be at, at the forefront? Hugh, would you like to lead the way? Yeah, happy to. So I, I, I guess where it's a regulatory-driven approach, I mean, uh, ideally the regulators have got some outcomes in mind and they want to create a catalyst so they can get there more quickly and then play a supervisory role and not be too hands-on. That's almost the ideal scenario. Now, I, I think in this, this, this whole world, I, I think we'll see bits that move towards that more supervisory phase earlier than others. So again, in the UK, as an example, kind of that first open banking implementation was sort of approaching the end of the beginning it's still fairly early in, in the journey. Um, the regulator's still pretty hands-on. It'll look different in different markets. But um, as like I was saying with standards earlier, I think this is a relatively early, still quite nascent. So things will get more complicated before they get easier. So I, I think for a while, there's going to be some thorny questions to answer. So as these open APIs move from sharing transaction information to actually I'm giving consent to provide some identity assertions, um, then that brings in some other considerations around, I don't know, data protection and liability and, and all of these things. As the data that's shared then gets enhanced and more values added around, it may be combining energy data with banking data. And then there's a question, of, actually, is that still the customers who owns that? There's, there's a bunch of thorny questions that I think the industry with the regulators and the participants will need to answer over time. So I, I think some bits will drift into the background as they become BAU. And then as this expands and other use cases, it's going to pose some other really interesting questions. So um, I think it's going to be a while before, the, before this becomes completely in the background. I think there's some thorny issues and some really interesting questions to, to, to answer. But I think the industry will get much, much better at dealing with these things the more the, the more normal it becomes to have standards-based APIs and customers giving consent and information being shared securely. And how exciting that we're all part of it at the very, very beginning. Uh, Lorena, uh, Lorena, sorry, I'm, I'm losing my voice. Um, I'm interested in you just adding and, and sort of wrapping up in any way that you would like to because we will be closing this session in about three minutes. So uh, uh, a few years ago, 2016, 2017, um, I always thought open banking is like this uh, um, best kept exclusive party that only a small group of people are invited to. Because um, within the group, everyone's partying really hard, open banking, and we see the future, this is the vision, this is where we'll be going, everything will be made possible. But outside, if you ask any you know, bank customers, they have no idea. We still have people calling up. Uh, when I did the first proof of concept with the, within the FCA regulatory sandbox using open banking principle, we actually had people calling up saying, what is this? Can I, can I opt out? What is open banking? Um, so 
for it to really take off and become really BAU in the background, I think uh, you will need um, the, the the players in the all the players in the ecosystem to really embed this. So for that, you will need banks to be incentivized, driven enough to produce high quality APIs at good service standards. You will need TSPs to own up their um, you know regulatory responsibilities if they are to facilitate financial services. Uh, instead of that being passed on to the banks. And they need to be held um, to the same standards as banks in terms of customers' data, um, safeguarding, um, uh, because it's people's data and money we're talking about. So that is very important. And then with that, you then have the, the um, good enough consumer offering to entice customers for them to see the value of why do I need to opt into this open banking, whatever magical word, service. For them to feel safe and secure um, and then they will be willing to go and then you can get the ecosystem moving by that time maybe we can all relax and think okay it's it's done it's it's now part of the thing like you don't think twice when you send money digitally anymore uh, but uh, i agree with you um that's um that will that will take a, a little bit more cooking a little bit more cooking and safe and secure key, key words with open banking open safe and secure, yeah yeah really are key words and no, hit the nail on the head Marie, we have got two minutes, so um, please, would you just round it up and then um, I'll thank everybody. Yeah, absolutely. And I did just see one one question come through, uh, so Sorry. I might I might round off by by picking I, up that one yeah, um, around what stakeholder needs to understand the potential of open banking and finance the most. Um, I think um, one. Thank you, Dan, for that question. Yeah, um, the the agreeing with everything that Lorena and Hugh said, the tipping point in my mind will be when it's not just people in the cool party, like people in fintech and people in banks and people in financial services using this data, but it's when you have the big, high growth, high trust, um, in some cases at least high trust, but high usage and high convenience players using this these APIs as, as par for the course. So mm -hmm. if you think about a big marketplace or a, you think about the, the, the large consumer brands and SME brands that exist out there, the minute they start picking up um, on the potential of this data, it creates a really great incentive for banks to deliver those, those high quality APIs because those players can pay. Those players also treat data really well, generally. Um, sometimes they, they're so good at governing and keeping all that data that they have too much of it. Um, and, and that's also then where I think a lot of the convenience and the customer experience will be so fine tuned that it will create that move into BAU where it just becomes like nowadays, it's just accepted when you press an address that you'll see an embedded view of a Google Maps to, to use Hugh's example. And when that, that requires the really big high, so I'll just round off with one, one number um, in Korea, South Korea launched their open banking framework um, pretty quickly actually, and they use the central clearinghouse to do a lot of the centralized data development and API development. Uh, they now claim 20 million users connected to open banking within a year of launch. So the, the speed at which that has developed, if you look at the South Korean context, they have these mega and super apps who have everyone in South Korea on them, and they started adopting these APIs to so suddenly you just have adoption, and then it just becomes par for the course. So I think that's what we'll, uh, and in terms of what stakeholders then, I would say it's, it's uh, the people at those companies who can have the creativity and foresight to think about how that bank data could be really instrumental to making customer onboarding easier, verification easier, um, and all other sorts of use cases that might benefit from financial data. Marie, that's a, a visionary way to, to round things off. Um, I would like to thank all of the panel, and first of all, for bearing with the technology, and I'm going to um, apologize to Chris Wood. I've been having problems with my, my chat feed. So we got your question through, Dan. Thanks, Marie. And Chris, um, I'm sorry that we didn't get to your questions. I've literally just, just seen them now. It has been a panel where we've, we've battled through the technology, but we have had an amazing conversation around governance and frameworks. And we've done that a whistle top store, store, tour even of, of the world. So I would like to thank our amazing panel and I do hope I get the opportunity um, to sit down and do this with you again sometime. Ladies out in Hong Kong, you have worked really hard. I do hope there's a glass of wine somewhere with your name on it. Thank you very, very much for joining us today at API Days. And Hugh, as always, thank you.
Lorena Marie, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good evening. Yeah. Thank you. All that remains for me now is.